Our next section of the conference is going to be led by our global disability leaders, Mr. Eddie Bartnick and Professor Tim Staten. They are the authors of the Remedy Report and will share information about the remedy and what we need to know to move forward. You're going to do this part. What now? Along with my okay. friend. Along with my friend, Ed and Tim, we will hear from John Cox. John Cox is also a member of People First of Nova Scotia. Thank you very much, Lita and Anna, um, and good morning, everybody. Um, hey, that was just incredible, wasn't it? Um, I've worked right around the world. I've never heard an apology like that. So I just really want to acknowledge that um, today is a very, very special day. Um, so I, I'm Eddie. This is Tim. So we, um, Maria calls us Teddy for, for a bit of a joke. <laughs> so that's, that's the standing joke. So we're going to share this presentation. And um, we're both going to make a couple of introductory comments. And then we're going to just um, go through the remedy and explain things a little bit more. So just from my point of view, I just wanted to say, look, thanks so much for the opportunity. Uh, I've been working over 40 years like with people with disabilities and their families and people experiencing mental health challenges. Um, and this is probably one of the most uh, challenging and the, one of the most amazing pieces of work I've had the opportunity to do because this remedy is going to positively impact the lives of thousands and thousands of people in the next one to five years and for a long period after that. And that's, that's a pretty extraordinary um, um, thing to be involved with. And this is like a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, this has never happened anywhere else. So this is amazing. Uh, I want to acknowledge the strong leadership um, that's got us to this point. And uh, I use the word inclusive leadership because uh, people with disabilities and first voice have been part of everything that's happened. So as well as the government and the Disability uh, Rights Coalition. Um, and I just want to say that it's been this sort of combined leadership that has got us to the remedy, but it's, it's actually what's going to be required to take it forward, OK? So this is about all of us working together. Um, Tim and I, are both, and the other independent people we brought in as experts as part of the process, um, we bring all our wisdom and learning, um, and that's about what we know works, but also all the lessons that we've learned about what doesn't work, OK? Um, and so there's nothing in this remedy that hasn't been done, OK? So this is, this is all um, doable. Um, I also just want to thank um, Sir Maria and the Disability um, Support Program. Uh, I'm not sure whether Vince and Claire are here from, and Vicky yet from the um, Disability Rights Coalition. I want to thank them, um, Anna and um, Tricia, part of our team for the remedy. Um, and most of all, all the amazing people that contributed to the remedy. So it's really our shared remedy. So I'll just hand over to Tim for a few introductory comments. Yeah, thanks, Eddie. I, I just want to echo the, Eddie's words. This, this has been a, an amazing opportunity and a privilege and, and, and scary, right? <laughs> you get a call, oh, you want to come out and help us <laughs> rebuild the entire system? Sure, I'm not busy on Thursday. I'll <laughs> pop out for Vancouver. But it has been, a, you know, I've been doing this for about 40 years. And I've had opportunities in other parts of the world to, to do, as Eddie said, all of these things in pieces, but to, to have this opportunity to do this. But I, I guess a couple of things for me that everybody we worked with, from the folks at the DSP to the DRC folks to the folks we met in community, have been so gracious and welcoming and supportive of our work. It's made it really easy. Uh, and while I bring, I'm pretty sure it's because of my work history that, that I was asked to, to be part of this, I'm also a dad. I have a, a, a young adult son with a, a disability. So for me, the question in doing all of this was, was well, what would I want for Gus? Would this work for Gus? Does this make sense for my family? Because if it doesn't make sense for my family, we shouldn't be recommending it for your families. I also want to acknowledge that, that this is really scary. And I know for families, you've struggled. 
you hang on, you cry, you scream. So what we really want to do is, is, is bring real hope. And I just remember a quote from a friend of mine, Paul Kahn, who, who's a man who was treated incredibly badly by the system. Forced institutionalization, forced drugs, and he made a film about his experience. If you haven't seen it, it's online, and, and it's called Hope is Not a Plan. So while hope is important, we need a plan, and that's the privilege that Eddie and I have had to work with you to try to put a plan to that hope. So we're going to share with you very high level at first what that looks like, and we know it's going to raise more questions than answers. Uh, but both Eddie and I are easy to find and happy to chat about any of the pieces further than what we can do today. So we're just going to walk you through the big picture pieces, uh, and hopefully it'll give you some sense of, of what I like to call the architecture of, of how we're, we're going to proceed. So I'm going to turn it back to Eddie. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Whoop, need to go back one. Yeah, cool. Okay, we're just going to talk through the remedy because it's got various layers. And I'm sort of aware that when people get a lot of new information, sometimes it's um, hard to absorb everything. So if you hear it a few times, you, you can take in the next level of detail. So just sort of going back to the remedy, uh, the four key points, it's about systemic discrimination and the court finding in 2021. It's about the province as a whole. It's not just the Disability Support Program or the Department for Community Services. So it's a whole province government wide thing. We've got the two parties, the Department of Community Services and the Disability Rights Coalition um, who work together to create the remedy. And it will address how people with disabilities access social assistance, supports and services to live in the uh, community. And the four areas of discrimination, and uh, the Premier did mention these as well, unnecessary institutionalisation, um, being denied um, a service um, because of the extent of your need, people having to leave their communities where they are to go to where the services were, so leave, to leave their family and friends in the local community, and then these long wait lists, okay? And so there were these four key areas, and the remedy had to focus on those four key areas. So it's not everything about everything, it had to be specifically focused on those four areas. And the process we went through, um, pretty pretty amazing process <laughs> in the period of time. We met, um, Tim and I met with a lot of people individually in Nova Scotia. We met with the minister, the deputy minister. Um, we had public meetings, we had private meetings, we had online meetings. Um, I, I just want to just, one of those meetings, we had the, the public meeting um, held in the community recreation facility. And um, uh, Vicky, I think Vicky's up the back there, so Vicky, Hey, Vicky. Um, Vicky chaired that for us, and uh, we had about 50 people there. And I was just struck by the goodwill, about how many good ideas there were about things that people could do. Okay, so it's not all gloom and doom. People had energy and great ideas. We read a mountain of documents um, uh, and policies and submissions and things. We did a whole bunch of online workshops. Um, we did this excruciating work around the data and the numbers of people to make sure we understood exactly what we were dealing with. Um, Maria, through the DSP, set up a government roundtable for the first time. We got all the relevant government departments together to talk about the remedy and their responsibilities, which was extraordinary. We then came back in January, did more face-to-face -face meetings. It was getting close to <laughs> the final remedy. And then we were just very, very pleased that we were able to provide a report which went to both parties. Uh, and um, so grateful that they agreed with, with the remedy. It then went forward to the Board of Inquiry and then was formally um, agreed in the middle of the year. So this was, this was, I was saying to Barb, this is extraordinary <laughs> that we've actually got this all agreed to and sort of moving forward. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can just sort of see it's a bit of a word cloud that Anna put together. She's pretty clever around all this stuff, but the key ideas sort of coming from the submissions and, you know, not flexible, hard to navigate, underfunded, culture change needed, more education, more training, hard to navigate, you know, undervalued. So these are the themes that we sort of brought into um, to the remedy. Okay. I'm just going to move forward into, there are six key directions in the remedy, um, and they all sort of fit together. And, um, but I just want to, I'm going to start with the first one, which is around this idea about 
better support for planning and coordination. And, and pretty much, um, I think in the old system, we've, we've got a system of care coordinators that have got huge caseloads, and it's about sort of dealing with people who've got the most critical needs and trying to find a service for people somewhere across the province, and, and that, that has a lot of limitations, okay? Um, and so if our vision is that people are well supported to live a good life in their local community, we find that they do better if they've got somebody alongside them that gets to know them, that is connected to the community, that can help people think about the life that they want and build that in their local community. So this first strategy is about pretty much we're doubling the number of people that will be available to work with people around their planning and coordination. So we've currently got care coordination really stretched. This is now going to um, um, become four separate strategies. We'll have a whole province-wide local area coordination strategy, so there'll be somebody based in local communities who'll be accessible, who'll get to work with uh, you all in your local communities, a ratio of, of one person to about 50 people supported. Um, there'll be in, uh, intensive planning support coordinators um, who'll work with people coming out of institutions and also who are not receiving any services. And they'll have a ratio of about one to 20, which means they can really get to know people and work closely with people. We've then taken the uh, eligibility assessment and funding into a separate role. So it's separate from the people that will help you plan and coordinate your support. And then the fourth part of this is we're going to uh, create some capability where, where there can be peer and technical support for people to do their planning. So if people want to do their planning with people that are people, um, um, people with disabilities, people with mental health challenges, families, um, then they can have their support from those groups. Okay, as well as have support through the Disability Support Program. Okay, and then just um, the remedy goes through years one to five. So, so year one, we're doing all the planning for that, for the new jobs and the recruitment. Uh, next year, the, the new positions will become operational. And then within three years, we will have the, the, region, the um, province completely covered with these new staff. And then we'll start doing our review of, uh, of all that. Okay, so the first, first direction is about better support for planning and coordination. I'll now move over to Tim to jump up and pick up on the key direction two. So perhaps the, the sort of most prominent element is the, the closing of the, the institutions. Uh, for us, sorry, the lady in the back had your hand up. You know, an institution, there is a definition that, that we've used from the, the, uh, the Institutionalization Task Force of People First Canada. And, and basically, an institution, it's not just a building. It's a, anywhere where people are, are forced to live collectively, where they don't have choices in their life. So it can be small or large. Uh, we're not going to have time to deal with a lot of questions now, but I'm happy to, to chat with that more later, if that's OK. Uh, so, but what I wanted to say is that closing institutions, we, we, we actually stopped thinking about it in those terms, because it's not about closing institutions. It's about people returning to their communities and living in their communities. So, so we, we kind of have re thought that a little bit in terms of how we want to talk about it. But it's a complicated process. So we have a five-year schedule to, to close all of the, the, the larger facilities in the province. Uh, we know to do that, it doesn't mean you just open the doors and people walk out. So we put in a number of, of uh, supports to do that. So the, the first will be a, an emergency response capacity in the community so that, that if folks are having difficulties and need support, the response is not to send them back to the institution. The response is to get what they need to them in their own communities. Uh, we want to stop admissions, because as long as the doors are open and people are going in, you get a revolving door. So, so that will be a big piece of this. Uh, the main process, and we can talk a bit more about this later in the day, is to have a, a dedicated what we call an intensive planning and support coordinator. Everyone will have uh, someone that they work with to help them figure out what they want for their life, where they want to live, the things they want to do. 
and to start to put together the resources and the supports they need to, to move that forward. And we've pegged that at a very low ratio. So they will have a caseload of roughly 1 to 20, and that compares to roughly 1 to 85 of the current mm -hmm. case managers. So there will be capacity to really work closely with, with each individual and their families and their networks. Uh, we know that, that the resources are, are not in community in all cases, so there will be a de dedicated resource person to help develop that. So the planner and the person figure out what they want. They can talk to the resource, say, this is what we need to make my life work in this community. So someone that will work in the community to do that. And all of this will be done on a, a regional basis. So each region, there'll be five regions. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit more about that in a second. And each region will have a dedicated closure team that will, that sole focus will be working with those individuals and with those institutions to get folks back where they belong into their communities. Eddie. Oh no, I'm next to us. You're next. Still me. <laughs> uh, so we talked a little bit about the need for new community services, uh, that we know they're not there. We made a decision very early on that we didn't want to just move from large institutions to smaller facilities. So we will not be developing new, uh, or we've recommended that they not develop new uh, group homes and those kind of facilities. And we will look to much more individualized kind of processes, so things like uh, home share where an individual lives with the family, uh, is part of that, that family community, uh, is supported by them, but also by external folks. Uh, the big piece will be uh, using individualized funding to develop very individualized, highly personalized kind of supports. And to do that, we will be taking the ILS program and taking off the the, the shackles, if you like, to expand that and allow a much broader array. We describe that as bridging the gap between the cost of a small option home and what is currently available in ILS and making that level of resources available to, to folks who need it. Uh, we're looking at temporary shelter arrangements and shifting that from a kind of crisis-driven program to an innovations program. So let's use those opportunities to learn what people need and how to do better to support folks with complex challenges. We have folks that, that need a lot of complicated support, so we need to learn how to do that better. Uh, looking at school leavers, so folks have a plan as they come out, so they're not, parents often describe this as falling off the cliff. Your kid becomes an adult. Well, now what the hell do I do? So we want to try to, to rectify that. And we spoke about the planning uh, side. We want to make sure that that also uh, is provided for folks on the wait list or folks coming into the system. And Eddie's going to talk a bit more about one of the, the ways we're going to do that in the course of today. So I'm going to turn it back to Eddie okay. for direction four. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, so the current situation, if people require um, access to allied health and clinical supports is often that these um, supports are in the institutions or in the hospitals. And our vision is that uh, people don't leave their community to go to where the services are. In fact, we try and bring the services back to where people are in their local communities. So that really means sort of rethinking the way in which um, allied health and clinical support is going to be provided. It's going to become much more regionally and locally based. Um, and so, um, and so the current situation is that there are some resources, they're quite limited and they're based in the institutions. So this is quite a, a major piece of work. And so just some of the things we'll be doing is that uh, the, the clinical resources we've got in the institutions will be coming out into a regional hub and will be built up so they're available for everybody in that region. So it'll be, it'll be a community-based um, local hub. Um, it will be based on the evidence from other jurisdictions. Um, and uh, I know from my own work in other places, this is, this is significantly underdone here. And so if we want to support people in the community, we need better support around communication, behaviour support and, um, and clinical support. So those sorts of things. 
We're doing significant work with um, the mental health sector, the Office of Mental Health and Addictions. Um, they're key partners um, uh, for the people that we support. And so we've got some programs now, but they're going to be um, really beefed up. Um, and uh, I know Marie has already started a process of working with health and mental health to map the current services, the gaps, and to come up with a plan to, to rebuild um, those services um, through specific proposals. And the other key thing is um, the disability support program has had no clinical leadership. There's, there's not been anybody who's, who's been able to lead this work, so we're actually creating a lead position, which then means that the disability support program can, um, can negotiate equally <laughs> with the health system and the mental health system, which are quite powerful, complicated systems. Okay? So we're building the capacity here, coming up with a plan, and then looking to build this capability uh, throughout the regions. Okay, back to you, Tim. So a big, a big piece that I'm sure you've all heard about is, is a shift to a, an individualized funding model. Now, individualized funding's been around for 40 years. It's, it's now the, the only way that folks are supported in Australia. Uh, it's the, the primary support for many people in the UK and, and other provinces have moved it. So it's not a new idea but it's sometimes misunderstood. So the, the idea is that everyone in the province will have an individualized budget. So they may not actually want to do the nuts and bolts and to control it, but the, the money for their supports will be dedicated to them. So just to give you a bit of an example, right now we fund services. So we fund a small option home. We don't fund the people in that home. So what does that mean? That means people's supports they need to live their life are tied to that home. So they have no choice about staying there or moving. So what we really want to create with individualized budgets and funding is portability. The fact that someone says, you know, this has been great, but I'm ready to move on. And they can then access their portion of the budget to move to that pit. Other folks will want to, to manage that with their family or with their network themselves, have their own individualized funding, hire and fire the folks they want to support them, choose where they want to live. But that's going to need some support because it's a, I, my, I have individualized funding for my son, and it's a pain, pain in the you-know-what sometimes to administer all that. So we're, we have recommended that they build what we call a backbone system that will help people find employees, manage those employees, do the payroll, hire, fire, all of those nuts and bolts things that, that as, a, as a family or as an individual, you really don't want to be, the Brits would say, you don't want to be arsed with it, you know? <laughs> so we, we're, we will have an a independent hub system that will help support all of that. Uh, the, the new system for assessment and, and assigning uh, or figuring out who gets what resources will be introduced, that, that the intention is it will be much more transparent. Folks will know why they're here in this funding range and what they have access to. Uh, so again, individualized funding is just a tool, but it's a tool of choice, and it's one that, that I've worked on for over 40 years because I'm group of parents I worked with in a group called the Woodlands Parent Society way back when. Their kids were all in institutions and they all wanted them out. And they kept being told, your son's to this, to that, but our service can't fund them because they're too difficult. We won't take them. They're too complicated. Uh, and the origins of individualized funding was as simple as a group of moms saying, well, if our kids are too complicated for that service you're funding, why don't you fund us and we'll sort it out? <laughs> and that's what we're trying to achieve in Nova Scotia, to give people real choice and control and to have that, you need choice over the resources. Uh, and I'm gonna send it back to Eddie. You can see the way we work together. It's, it's a lot of fun. So. <laughs> so we've sort of got those five key directions, but sort of sitting under that are what we call um, the sort of system capacity and enablers. These are things that need to be in place to support all the initiatives. And um, so, so currently, or in the past, the Disability Support Program 
is a small division in a big department, and that's never going to be able to carry the remedy forward. Okay, so we had to think about what do we need to do to build that up so that it could uh, this could all work. And so there's, there's a whole bunch of ideas here. I'll just sort of go through them pretty quickly. The first one was um, we need stronger governance. We need a, a minister that's in the cabinet, um, and also. We, we, we want um, to have uh, like a, an infrastructure in the regions, okay? This is, this is the new world, you know, stronger governance and uh, presence in, in the regions. Uh, the second thing is about um, this idea of monitoring and review because the, there is a court process of monitoring and making sure the remedies are on track. And so part of that is the recommendation about an external university team to help with um, measurement of outcomes and progress so that we can be assured that lives are improving for people. Okay, that's the second bit. Um, you saw in the word cloud that Anna had done, like um, cultural change and training was huge. Okay, moving from this world to this sort of world. Um, so there'll be a leadership and capability plan uh, for cultural change and conferences like this. We're able to talk about uh, what's happening and about progress. And Lorna this afternoon will be talking about some of these ideas about the cultural change and what's required. Um, I've already mentioned the, inter the intergovernmental work and the government roundtable. So that now is a solid structure that is bringing in all the other key government departments to make sure that they're key, they're key part of this remedy. Um, there's some legislation and policy work uh, to, in to support a human rights approach. A simple one of those would be the eligibility policy had to be changed to stop excluding people, okay? As an example, there'll be a disability workforce plan, there's investment in housing, um, there's some great ideas about supporting innovation, partnerships and transition. And I just wanna note, the regional hubs will have an innovation fund, so great ideas about building capability locally, and also there'll be a transition fund for service providers, because there'll be, you know, they'll need to be supported to make the changes to this new way of, of working. And then it doesn't sound very exciting, but um, there's this piece of work which is about making sure we understand the entire population, who they are, who's coming in the door, to make sure that the system can properly cater for everybody we know now and all the new people in the future. So we're never back to the situation of having to ration and wait lists. Okay? So that's another very, very important part of all that. So Tim's now going to talk a little bit about the regional hubs, which is. Um, yep. Was that five? We're, five, we're right five. on perfect, time. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, we're, we're slipping, Eddie. We're on time. Uh, so I, I just want to share with you a little bit about sort of what the new architecture overall system is going to look like. So because the, the key point here is to drive the work down to community, right? This is about building communities, making sure folks are part of their communities. So we want to get away from a centralized system, and, and part of that is to, to set up five regional hubs across the province where, where much of this work will take place. So the hubs will have the, the planning support coordinators will be we based out of those. The local area coordinators will be based in local communities, but report into their, their regional hub. Uh, the closure teams for each region will, will base out of these areas. Uh, as well as a number of the other sort of technical bits. The, uh, I mentioned the, the community capacity developers will be based out of those. So the regional hub, it's kind of, we, we know it doesn't get right down to communities, but, but it brings it closer to each area where the, the distinct complexion and culture of each part of the province can be reflected in how, how we, we work. Part of that will be rather than folks having to come to Halifax for complicated services or allied supports, those will be based attached to, to the hubs regionally in the clinical and allied supports that Eddie talked about. Uh, another piece that we're really excited about is each of those regional hubs will have an advisory committee. That advisory committee will have parent representatives, first voice representatives, uh, service provider representatives, as well as the kind of intersectional representatives that, that Senator Bernard talked about, so representatives of the indigenous community, of the African Nova Scotian community, to make sure that those voices are at the table. And the advisory group 
will look at the plans and things coming out of that region, the closure plans, advise the, the professional staff and the DSP staff on, on how to proceed with those elements. Uh, we're also, will locate a, an innovation fund. So there will be in your region and controlled by the advisory committee, not by the professional staff. Hey, this group of families has a really cool idea. Let's try it out. We have a bucket of money. We don't have to go through a lot of hoops and, and experiment in our area to see if we can do better for our folks in our community. So that's very broad kind of picture of, of the hub, but that's what we, we envision will be the main kind of point of contact between the system and the community and the individuals. So I think we're one more to go, and I don't see a sign from Devin, so we're good. Uh, <laughs> I just see that, that the picture is, you know, more personal, more local, you know, regional, and then of course some province-wide things, but sort of a real push to make things uh, more, more local. Okay, just sort of moving ahead just quickly. Um, it's not very exciting reading, but the remedy actually sets out year by year targets, indicators and outcomes, which is really critical because it talks about what needs to happen in what order and by when. And that will then be the foundation for the, uh, the court monitoring each year. Um, and I just want to say um, there was this incredible tension as part of the remedy where um, uh, Disability Rights Coalition pretty much was um, people's rights not being upheld. Every day you take is one day too long. <laughs> we want all this done today, tomorrow. And then we've got the service providers and the government folks and other people saying, oh, it's going to take time to build the capability. And, and so what Tim and I have done is really try to manage this, this tension between as quick as we can, but as well as we can. And that's why it's set out so methodically over the five years. So the remedy had some things that we said could be done while we're waiting for the court to agree. They are all under, underway. Um, it, it talks about a five year period, then, then a review. We've done some implementation workshops around, uh, we didn't wait for the court um, decision. Um, and I, I just really want to say that um, Tim and I are hugely impressed by the amount of commitment and um, progress and hard work that's been done. It may not be obvious to everybody about what's happening in the background, but we're, we're very, very uh, delighted with that. And also, Maria's set up uh, these provincial advisory groups, and then we'll have the network of regional hubs and advisory groups. So I just want to say, and this conference is a wonderful start to this process. So we're now going to hand over to our very good friend, uh, John Cox. Um, so John's a member of the um, Department's Disability Advisory Council, or a committee. He's, he was a great contributor to the development of the remedy. Uh, I personally, um, have found John to show tremendous personal leadership. And he's someone who also models working in partnership as well. So, and I know, John, as you're coming up, that Tim's got a few words he'd like to say as well, so. Just uh, to echo Andy's comments, but John, and to show you, given the opportunity, what, what folks can achieve, John worked as a researcher on one of my institute's research <laughs> projects. And I just had an email last night that, uh, Academic journal publication has been accepted, and John is one of the authors on that. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank John. Thank you so much. Uh, cheers, buddy. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Cindy. I'm going to sit here. I've got my mic on. Is it? Am I on? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay, let me just get organized here. Sorry for the wait. So, um, for some reason, since um, starting working on the remedy, I've been thinking a lot more about my brother, Mark, who um, passed away in the old children's training center. 
um, which, oddly enough, it were probably on the site or very close to the site of the old children's training center where he spent the last four years out of his five short years of his life. Um, my parents don't even know why he passed away, and I don't think we'll ever know. One question I've never asked is why him and not me? And I don't, I don't want to know the answer to that, to be honest with you, but yeah. Sometimes I wonder, with the remedy, are we 60 years too late? Some 13 or 14 years later, I was introduced to people first. People like Victor Fenton, Peter Park, Pat Worth, <coughs> and Gordon Fletcher. They were talking about deinstitutionalization not a word that is plain language, but an important word to people first. And in fact, something that doesn't need to be translated into plain language for any people first members. In fact, I wish Victor was here today. Because he would have been so happy. Taught me so much. I love you and I miss you. <clears throat> the people I know who have been institutionalized tend to remember the past and not in great ways. There's a lot of hurt, pain, and suffering because people who have been incarcerated because people have been incarcerated for no other reason except they were born. And I want to say incarcerated is not the right word because people with disabilities don't get the same rights as prisoners. They don't get to be put away by a judge and a jury of their peers. And so I say incarcerated but I don't know if that's the right word or not. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, ba -ba -ba. But here we are making a plan to close the big institutions in Nova Scotia. We've had these talks before and people are distressful, dis, 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 distressful because promises have been made in the past, uh, but today is different. I've always had trouble talking to and dealing with representatives from government agencies. Sometimes I've, I'd rather beat my head against the wall. It might be more productive <laughs> in some ways, but I gotta say in the past, oh, probably longer than two years, two, three, four years, I don't feel that anymore. I feel hope. And more importantly, I feel listened to. There's a dialogue. And, and, and I go on the limb and say, and other members of the committee feel the same way. But you'll have to ask them. <laughs> this time it feels different. It feels right. But in order to successfully make this happen, in my opinion, we need to do two things. So these are my opinions, so th three things. Um, these are my opinions, so take it for what it's worth. Number one, we need to heal, healing. People need time to heal. People, especially those who have been incarcerated for a long time, need to feel the sense of self-worth and empowerment. And this has to be an individualized healing process. 
My friend Dave from Manitoba says, burn them down. It's what he needs to do and say to feel whole again. Healing takes patience because sometimes true safety may never come. Did I do that? No. Not only do we have to allow people to heal, we also have to heal families as well as our communities so that all Nova Scotians can feel whole again. Number two, we need choices. Nothing about us without us. <laughs> yeah. Am I done? <laughs> it, is, it is important to know that allowing people to make their own choices does not mean you have to agree with those choices. There also has to be dignity of risk. People have the same rights and to experience failure as everyone else. People need the opportunity to make choices that are unique to them. In many ways, as support people, you need to leave your values and biases at the door. No matter your views on race, religion, or sexuality, the choices I may make the choices I make may not be the same as what you would make, but that's okay. As individuals, we need to be who we are, and the choices we make need to revolve around who we are. And number three, supports. Not only is it important to live in the community, but it is important to have a great quality of life. And that's important. It's not about having a life, it's about having a great quality of life. I know what it's like not to be able to leave my apartment because I don't have the cost of a cup of coffee. So when we talk about employment, housing, and being a part of the community, we also have to be aware that it is not just about the job. It's okay to go to work, but we should also have the opportunity to do social activities, like having a few beers after work or joining a bowling team, if we choose with our coworkers. So supporting people with disabilities is not about is not only about being in the community but also about being a part of the community and providing opportunities that traditionally have not been available to us i've jokingly said that now we are closing institutions that I can retire. <laughs> but closing institutions is actually the easy part. Whether you blow them up, close them down, or my personal favorite, I'd love to see a site become a toilet museum. It's a, it's a thing, look it up. It's a thing, look it up. But working together, um, oh, or no, I'm missing something. Oh, up here? Yeah. Whatever we do with the buildings, we need to ensure as a community that the institutions stay closed. Yeah. Um, but the hard work, the most exciting work, is ahead of us. Providing supports, education, and a sense of belonging to people with disabilities is not going to be easy. 
Sometimes it will be frustrating. Working together, governments, families, individuals, and communities, we can make it work. We may stumble at times. We're definitely going to disagree at times. But we should never forget that the goal of allowing people we, but we should never forget the goal of allowing people to be a part of our community.